Um, so yeah, MG will be on here. He is going to be talking about rapid prototyping chaos. So for those of you who have followed MG, uh, his, his work, he has done a significant amount of really, really interesting projects with hardware, including backdooring everything from charging cables to power bricks to you name it, he's probably backdoored it. Um, and so he's, he has uh, a few projects that are out there uh, that you can purchase, uh, the OMG cable and Demon Seed. Um, you may have seen some of his POC videos or heard him on our podcast uh, in years past, but he is here to talk to us about rapid prototyping with hardware. So, yeah, um, it's almost about time, I guess, in, in a minute. Uh, everybody yeah. retweet out about this if you uh, want to. And um, So, MG was uh, one of our, our initial thugs from the thug crowd. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's hand it over. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. We, all right, we are good to go. Um, I'm going to switch over to my desktop real quick and share that. This is my about me slide. It's really all I got. I'm gonna talk about the last, I don't know, about year worth of rapid prototyping I've done. Uh, Cause it kind of changes the way you think. And uh, here's a, just a stack. This is actually about six months old now, a stack of all my failures, like all the PCBs I've made that just didn't work. Uh, but. Before we get into there, I'm gonna go back to 2017, before I knew how to do any of this. Uh, I decided I wanted to make an exploding USB drive. I just, cool idea, right? But let's cross it with the USB rubber ducky because, you know, naturally, uh, had no idea how to do any of that. So I sketched the basic schematic out on paper. That's literally what you see here. And this is the physical layout of the board. It's, um, it, it worked, right? Like there were a lot of uh, software packages out there for designing things um, that it was just too complex. It was just uh, more of a hurdle than I wanted. So you know, I was gonna use some, some paper, right? And didn't know how to make PCBs, but I found these cool uh, grids of copper squares called SMT pads. And it's what I was using to kind of construct this very first prototype using copper tape and stuff. It worked, kind of, you know, assembled it. And that was the, the first uh, prototype here. I call this Mr. Self-Destruct, right? And here it is, you know, chopped off a USB connector from an existing flash drive because, you know, where, where do I get USB connectors, right? Um, this had the little bonus if we go back up into the schematic. Over on the right is um, basically kind of like a relay that would allow an additional pin to, I wanna be careful here, but basically uh, that allowed the, uh, the fun activities to happen later on. That was really the only addition. The rest of the circuit was basically just an AT tiny that would bit bang. Bit banging is where you may not have inside the silicon of the chip, the ability to do a certain thing. In this case, this chip didn't have USB, but we can turn on and off the pins really fast and emulate what USB is expecting on those lines. The rest of that circuit's already, you know, well established. So I just took that and added a little uh, high power relay to it. And ultimately what we got was this, plenty of room inside here for all the activities. And I don't have sound shared here. Let me see if I can do that real quick. That's ah, great, whatever, we're good. Anyway, uh, this was the first Mr. Silk Destruct, right? So you plug it in and ducky payload kind of unwinds on the screen, opens your browser and opens a video and you see a little jack in the box here. You hear the jack in the box sound is what you would hear if I had sound shared, but I don't. And it goes for a little bit longer than you'd expect because we got to build tension, right? And then eventually, pop, a uh, bunch of confetti flies out. That's cool. Um, put other things in there like 
smoke bombs, right? Looks pretty cool. Um, ultimately, you know, that, that was pretty cool. Uh, what else could I do with it? And I started playing around with this basically really tiny ducky, um, which, you know, the, the actual USB rubber ducky has way more space and it's, it's a lot faster, but everybody knows what a ducky is. So I'm just using that as a general term here. I decided to shove the demon seed inside of a cable and that's where we got this, right? My cable didn't actually work as a cable. It just looked like a cable. It's not really a cable, but you know, there's always room for improvement there. Basic idea there, right? Yeah, it was chunky, it was big, it's you know, very the very first one, right? And might as well shove that into a USB condom at the same time, right? Why not? Like that makes sense. Everybody, everybody looks at oh, cable this is why we need condoms. I'm like, cool, you need condoms, let's fuck up your condoms. Same concept, right? I'm not gonna let all of these videos unwind because that will take a while. Polish this up a little bit more and suddenly we've got, let's skip forward a little bit. Same concept, but now it charges. We're not, we're not getting data sync yet, but it charges, right? Which is an improvement and visually looks a lot better. It's, it's not exactly a, a match to a an Apple cable, but it's close from a distance. But you know, if we want to use this for actual offensive tooling, uh, it's probably not going to pass when it's in the hands of a target. It looks cool on stage, but that's about it. So about a year later, so that, that was all 2017, very early 2018. About a year later, I decided I wanted to kind of ramp it up. And actually, here's a, here's a good comparison. It's a close match, but you can see this, uh, this physical, the, the large connector here on the right on the top is it's a bit chunkier. It's longer. Uh, it's, it's a close match, but it's not perfect. Anyway, a year later, I decided I wanted to chase that further. You know, let's, let's get data passing through. So it's a real cable, right? Uh, it works like a real cable data passes charges, but also, you know, let's, let's update these payloads remotely because you know, that that's kind of what I would want to do as an attacker. And Rewinding to what you just saw, every time you want to update a payload there, you have to plug the thing in, update it. Um, you know, cool. And it will just play onto your computer as you plug it in. You can put a delay, but it's much like a rubber ducky in that sense. You plug it in and then it starts. But in addition to updating them remotely, it would be cool to have a trigger that's remote. You know, how do I do that? I, I have no idea. It's just, I want to accomplish this. How do I design that? And about a year ago, year and a half now, decided, okay, um, software, when you approach it, at least the way I approach it, it's, it's really quick to just change something, compile, see what breaks, see what changes, and just keep doing that over and over and over. That's you know a matter of seconds per, per cycle, per spin. Uh, with hardware, you know, creating a PCB, it's, you know, weeks roughly per spin. Um, you, you gotta design it and you send it off to some manufacturer, now, there are in-home methods for doing this, um, and that's what I kind of started exploring there. The older one is using acid to etch copper off of a board. So FR4, or there, there's multiple types here, but I'm using FR4. Uh, basic concept here is you've got copper, at least on the top layer, sometimes also the bottom layer, uh, this is the number of layers your PCB is. So this is a two layer. In between, you've got some fiberglass and epoxy mixture that's just non-conductive. That's the basic of what a PCB is. And ultimately those get turned into PCBs, right? And here is a raw FR4 panel, right? It's, it's just all copper sheet on at least one side. And then that yellow you see is the fiberglass mixture. So, Here's a mill cutting out traces. Instead of using acid to remove portions of the board, we're just using a mill. And this is quick. It's a lot more accurate, um, more repeatable, in my opinion anyway. And that's what I decided I wanted to start chasing. 
you can see the process here. You mill it, solder, solder things up, and boom, you got a circuit. And it's it's a pretty fast process. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe an hour roughly per spin. Depends on what you're making, how big the board is, the complexity. But that's what I wanted to chase. I'm like, cool, I can now take my approach of rapid failure uh, to learn how to make these. So I decided to get one of these Bantam mills. I think they're like 2,400 bucks now. Uh, there are other mills out there uh, that are much cheaper. Uh, I specifically went for the Bantam because the software flow is really easy. You just dump the file out, out of your design software pull into the, the, the Bantam and it abstracts a whole bunch of things that are kind of connected to a CNC traces and uh, what is it called? Uh, speeds and feeds, you know, the, the mechanics, the physical nature of your tool moving. A lot of that is abstracted into pre-made libraries for you. So it's like quick and easy. And, you know, I can save a revision to my PCB and it, pull it into the Bantam software, you know, in seconds, you know, hit go and boom, new, new uh, PCB is ready to go. So on the left, I've got KeyCAD, this is just uh, PCB design software. This is the Mr. Self-Destruct at, at the time I pulled this in. I'm like, hey, that's gonna be like my hello world for the Bantam mill I just got. And the red layer is the top layer, the green is the bottom. And pull that into the, the Bantam software, right? And probably took an hour or two of back and forth and eventually you know this pops out it's like cool this this actually worked um would fit a, a uh, cable pretty nicely so great um you know hello world let's let's chase this deeper like let's get uh finer traces the the mill is advertised as not being able to do these smaller footprints but you know we, we could definitely chase it so lots of testing here you know, different depths, just really repetitive iterations, just to see where the boundaries on, on this mill are. This board looks wet because I've got it covered in oil. Uh, FR4, it's fiberglass. And when you mill it, it's glass and dust up in the air. So you got to have some way of either rapidly vacuuming that out, which I would later upgrade to. But oil, really, really heavy oil, uh, kind of painted on, would do a good job of trapping everything. So more, more testing, right? Test, test, test. And you know, here's some microscope shots on the top. This is just a minor difference here, but you can see the traces nice and clean on the bottom, really rough on the top. And the difference between those two is just the, the tips of these bits right here. The one on the left with the little sharper tip was making these nice clean cuts and the slightly rounded one would make these rough cuts. And you know, you don't, you don't really know. And I, I would always buy the cheapest tips because uh, they're called end mills, rather. Uh, I was breaking these a lot, and you know I can't pay twenty five bucks per. I'm gonna get the ten pack for you know, twenty bucks. Uh, so you know, figuring out what is a good, good uh, process here took a lot of iteration and playing around. And ultimately, uh, here's here's a much more detailed board that I was able to get out of this after doing these tests. And you know that's great. Uh, we've got copper, and clearly uh, places to put our components. Uh, we can solder these on, it totally works, but we're missing one key thing and this there is no real good solution. So I started playing around solder mask, right? So that's that green or whatever color you, you're used to seeing. Uh, basically, it's a lot like UV cure nail polish, right? Uh, there's there's uh, like solid film and other stuff, but for the most part, UV cured gel is the basics of most solder mask. Um, one common way of applying that is, you know, put a sheet down and you're using sheets of like transparency film that uh, have like black printed on it to block off UV, but you know, we've got a mill, so why not just remove that, right? So I was able to get pretty reliable results here. And here's, here's the basic process I ended up settling on. It's first you cut out your traces. Put some tape down, apply the goo, you know, it's gel right here. This is the UV gel. And then scrape it with a razor blade. The scotch tape I put down here kind of acts as a shim. So I get this nice thin layer of gel. And I take a 
UV LED. This is a really big panel. I started with like a UV flashlight, but I didn't like waiting. Uh, so, you know, I got this, it's like a 40 watt panel that just happens to fit inside of the mill. Perfect, right? Let that go for a little bit. And then out pops a cured layer of SAR mask. And then I started just using the same engraving bits here to remove the cured solder mask from the areas I needed it removed over the pads. And you know, it worked pretty well, but ultimately I discovered these things called drag tips. And again, expensive, but I talked to a somewhat local tool manufacturer and convinced him to make a really reduced version. And uh, this is kind of what popped out. And this is what it looks like. So a drag tip, it's got this engraving tip mounted inside like a, a spring mounted collet around it. So that allows the softer solder mask to be eaten away and the copper is harder. So the tip kind of stops and hovers over it. You can't sit for too long, but it buys you more time so that you're not cutting through that really thin layer of copper quite as easily. And this made the process a lot faster and that was great. And that was kind of the result, right? You get this and then you cut it out. Cut the holes, cut the perimeter, pull it out. And there we go. That's, you know, that's the, the basics of what this process looks like. Now, one, one problem with a lot of these is, uh, basically one problem with all homemade PCBs is the vias. The vias are what transfer conductivity from the top to the bottom. So you got a hole that goes through. And the easy way is to just put little tiny wires and solder them into place on both sides. And that's kind of what you see here, those little blobs of solder. I started playing around with a couple different other methods uh, using conductive epoxy and stuff like that. These all were interesting. Uh, it's not super reliable all the time, depending on how much current you're passing through it. But again, uh, you can produce some really good looking results with it. So, you know, here it is, the vias are hidden under that solder mask and you know, playing around with a lot of different designs and accidentally did a cross section, but it's cool because you get to see that the conductivity uh, of the top layer passes through to the bottom layer. That's you know, what we were going for. Um, this isn't good for just making, you know, little prototypes and whatnot. Uh, when you're designing things, breadboarding, for instance, uh, breakouts are great, but that restricts you to, you know, parts you can find breakouts that match, right? But, you know, what if, what if I just make my own breakouts? Cool. Like, here's this chip that I, I didn't have a breakout for. It's fairly common. You can find uh, breakouts that match this, but... Again, uh, I also don't have to wait for delivery. So that was cool. I could just make these in a day. Or you can make, uh, you know, custom little breakouts. Like I wanted this specific component, this really tiny component that wouldn't fit in a breadboard or on here. Uh, I wanted that in line on USB for some testing. And you know, this is what I got out of it. Uh, you can make full scale, uh, you know, full, full uh, circuit prototypes. We can also make these little breadboard expansions. So again, you've got some really small components, you wanna test them on a breadboard. Well, you know, how do you do that? Especially when you want a very customized breakout. So, you know, here, this is, this is how, right? And we get real small here. That one on the right, on the red, that's a BGA uh, component. And there's a lot of different ways to go about it. I started playing around with the solder mask define on the left, right? So instead of bringing your solder mask up to the edges, you actually bring it over the copper so that you get smaller detail. And that allowed me to do things like this, right? So this, this uh, I think there's a 0.4 millimeters between uh, each uh, ball here, center to center. 0.4 millimeters and that's you know really tight and you can't really pull traces between those balls but you can do interesting tricks like you can see here there's a ball that's missing because I run a trace underneath and I use the solder mask to kind of insulate that layer. So uh, we get this very first prototype this was 
OMG cable, you know, V1 that dropped in, uh, what was it? I think it was 2019, February. Uh, you know, it worked barely, <laughs> had a lot of failures, so many different attempts at this, just, just in that first month. This, I started in uh, end of December and early February. So I think it was like five, six weeks to go through the whole process to get the very first prototype working. It just barely worked. And that's kind of what you see here. That's a little over a month of playing around. Uh, V2 started playing around with different uh, approaches of programming it. And, you know, I, I, don't, I lost track, but this is several months later, uh, getting closer to what would ultimately become uh, the production version of this. Now, again, the OMG cables, that's the, you know, the wireless connectivity. It's got you know, 100 times more space. I just, I really wanted to see how far I could take the concept. Like the AT Tiny with its, what, like, 8k of space is cool but let's let's add like a meg or more let's add an 802.11 radio let's put a web server in this thing let's like just see how far we can go and that was the point of the omg cable right and you know we're gonna need to start playing around here we're getting close to production i need to solder a bunch of these together let's get a toaster oven and mod it and that's going to allow me to solder a whole bunch of these omg cable components uh, onto boards uh, using solder paste. You gotta basically put that in the oven for a very controlled period of time and it allows the solder to melt and all your components get attached. Uh, get the family involved too, because you know things are scaling up. More of the family. Um, this is in DEF CON, like nothing ever stopped. It was barely done in, in time. This is me still assembling OMG cables in the hotel room and like heat curing components and stuff. Uh, but before DEF CON, I, I had this idea of like, hey, let's also make a whole bunch of the AT Tiny versions. You know, they're really low gray, but you know, they're interesting to people. It still gets that concept of a malicious cable. It's not really good for field use, but it looks like a USB cable and it's malicious from a demo perspective, right? But cool, let's, let's make that on a whim. It was like a month before DEF CON. I'm gonna make a whole bunch of those. That's kind of what they look like. Uh, hand assembled these, this, this sucks. Um, but basically there's solder paste on this panel and a whole bunch of little components. This is my wife helping uh, with a tweezers, putting every little component on every little panel. And here's me programming them on the airplane. These are, we would call these demon seeds. Uh, to differentiate them from the OMG, OMG cable. But of course, nothing's ever done in time. Uh, here's a whole group of people uh, awesomely helping me in a hotel room pack all of these into the little drug bays that I, I chose to use for the packaging. And that was great. Um, everybody loved it. I was not expecting that. You know, there's little $20 bags of, you know, handout kit. Uh, everybody was asking me after DEF CON, like, oh, I want to buy these. I want to buy these. And it's like, well, this, this was not something that I thought was worth like mass producing and selling. So I thought, you know, what, what can I do to make this better? So I wanted to get a basic wireless trigger functionality and get data pass through working without really adding any components. And ultimately I had to add, I think it was two more resistors to the entire circuit. I don't have to put a USB switch to put an antenna, any of this stuff on there. Um, and it, it, it works. Uh, the antenna like kind of barely works, right? Uh, but that's the point. It's more of an educational experimental thing to play around with, which was what everybody likes. So that's kind of where the, the V2 version and uh, that's, that's what this board would look like. And I made this kit and Hack5 is like, yeah, you can sell it on our site. I'm like, great, because I don't care about fulfillment or anything like that. I just want to make kit. Um, then you got you got these pins. If you can see right here, bottom left, there's a bunch of, there's like six pins. You needed those to program it as part of the kit, right? Uh, I had to sort, you know, sort and count six pins per bag. Uh, that sucked. So made this little tumbler that's, uh, got a, a vi vibrating arm, vibratory feeder is what these called. Uh, you know, 3D printed this, a lot of failures, but ultimately, you know, we got, we got this working. It was great. And it would dispense, uh, you know, six pins at a time in a little Dixie cup. And we put all the other parts and make a whole bunch of little bags. You can see it going on right here. Packed a whole bunch of demon seeds into, you know, hack five bags. Great. 
Um, come on, screw. Pick and place. So instead of tweezers, let's use the machine to place these little components on board. So start it here. Basic concept is starts off. Uh, come on, move a little faster. So this uh, this machine uses cameras to see what it's doing. And this little white strip of pa uh, paper here contains little components. The camera sees it, lowers a little syringe, uses suction to pick them up, and then it places it onto the PCB that already has paste on it. And I'm testing here by placing it on double-sided sticky tape. Slow, yeah, it kind of worked. Um, first results, things were not aligned. Ultimately, we got it there. And it was fast at this point, you know, a lot, lot faster than we started. Uh, a lot of modifications, and we can see it, you know, rapidly placing components onto the boards. Got a, like a field of panels here. It worked. Uh, um, you know, the addiction keeps going of speed more. So, you know, here I'm using a mill and a 3D printer to make these feeders. And feeders would feed, instead of putting these strips of tape on the table and have to carefully calibrate where it is, just have a feeder just kick a little component out one at a time and just goes back and forth. Um, oh, this was Christmas vacation with the family uh, in a hotel room. We're like, well, we got to pack all these OMG cables, uh, which had just come back from the factory. Those components are so small because everything's more complicated here. We actually, we had a factory do it. And we still had to test them and bag them. And you know, that's basically what I was doing in the hotel room when uh, the kids went to sleep. And of course, uh, nothing is complete without a really cool logo. So a year ago, I saw this cool dust, dust reel, made this awesome shirt. I'm like, man, that looks cool. USB logo, huh, I should do it like this. You know, I was thinking OMG, I'm like, I, I need a cable design, right? Uh, my wife said that that just looks way too phallic. And I'm like, oh yeah, I see it now. Hmm, that sucks. But, you know, this was my reply to her. <laughs> Tweak the M. Uh, threw it away, you know, came back months later when Demon C came back. I'm like, wait a second, maybe it's not an OMG cable logo. I mean, this is the Demon C logo because now the, uh, the weakness suddenly became a feature. I said, Dustrial, come fix this for me. Like, this is crap. And this is what he made. So this, this was the Demon C logo that popped out and it was great. I'm like, holy shit, this is, this is perfect, man. Um, and then OMG cable, of course, needed its own logo because totally different result. And, uh, that, that's what came out. And here were a lot of you know revisions he was making. But anyway, uh, that's kind of like the end. And I still wanted to leave space for questions. Do we have any Yo, questions? Let's see. MG, that was sick. That was awesome. I, uh, I always love I couldn't the... hear you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I said it was sick. I always love your uh, iconography of, of razor blades just around the place. Nice. <laughs> All right, there we go. Oh, yeah. So, do anybody, we have any questions? Does anybody in the chat have any questions for MG here? Dade says, show us the Furby. Oh, man, I have to go running in the house to get that. The Furby, <laughs> I have so many ideas. Uh, yeah, the Furby is this horrific, I mean, we just want to make the Furby, Furby as ugly as possible and just horrible as possible. Um, for instance, one of the features is that just popped into my head, I think it was the other week, is every time there's a general sentiment expressed on Twitter that is negative towards offensive security tooling, I would like the Furby to release actual flies from its mouth. So I don't... I, I've got all of that working except for the sentiment analysis, but you know. Highlight him. Skill six says, what's the next step? What's your next big idea? Next idea? <laughs> I never know. That's the thing. Everything is this, like I, I presented this in a fairly linear way, but the reality is all of those were in tandem and they would come up and go down off the, you know, the, the work table. And I just had this table in my mind of just things that could be or things that I don't know what they're for. I just know I need them for later. And they all just kind of assemble into whatever pops out. Um, I've got some really cool stuff that we have been chasing on the OMG cable that you know hopefully we'll be able to show off soon. Um, 
Yeah, there, I mean, there's there's refinements as well. I mean, I had like a 40% uh, manufacturing defect rate on the first batch of OMG cables. So I think I've got that worked out now, but I mean, that was huge. If anybody's into manufacturing, like, you know, you've got like maybe 1% or 2%. I had like 40% and that sucked. Um, but chasing things like that has been consuming a lot of time and all this stupid shit around like business and like registering and I hate that stuff. So yeah. thank you Hack5 for offloading some of that for me. It's great. Nice. And if everybody wants to like get some of these things or just look at some of the stuff, go deeper. I have archived a lot of this on o.mg.lol. Uh, mg.lol is where I've got the blog. o.mg.lol is where I've got like the products. Uh, if you want to just kind of look at what's in that landscape. Uh, so there's, this was a very quick speed run. <laughs> Awesome. awesome. And uh, I guess the Demon Seed kits for education are for sale as well. The cables are for yeah. sale for use in red teaming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, significantly awesome. different. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I think the, yeah, I, I mean, you can go check. I'm going to chill on the screen, uh, the stream. But yeah, o.mg.lol, lol, if you were wanting to look up either of those. Hell yeah. Um, shout out to Kevin.